Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar today. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, as we get started here, we'd like to invite you to participate in the polls that we have down at the bottom of the screen as we go through our announcements. So our next webinar will be tomorrow, Friday, November 10th at 4.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and that webinar is titled Back Up Your Data Now or Cry, and James Chan will be back again for us. Um, those are always good ones to come. Um, it's always important to make sure you keep your really important research saved so in case you know something happens you can always access that and you don't lose all of the hard work that you've put into it. So that'll be a good one. I hope to see you back tomorrow. Today we'll be pleased to hear from James Tanner who will be giving a presentation titled Stand and Deliver. What if your ancestor was a criminal? James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law from Arizona State University. He worked for 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 35 years of experience in genealogical research and is a blogger for Genealogy Star and the blog Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He is the co-author or author of over 25 books on genealogical research and has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. I'd just like to remind everybody that, that we have our questions box on the right hand side. Feel free to submit any questions during the presentation and we'll make sure that they are answered by the end of the presentation. And we'll turn the time over to James. Howdy, this is James Tanner. I'm glad to be here for another BYU Family History Library webinar. And remind everyone that these webinars are recorded and uploaded to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And we have quite a few you videos up there right now and we did, um, encourage you to subscribe to the channel that helps us become a little bit more visible among all the other millions and millions of videos that are up there today we're going to talk about stand and deliver what if your ancestor was a criminal okay as little as you would like to know this, or as much as you would like this, depends on your attitude, I suppose. It, there is always the possibility that one or more of your relatives was a criminal. I mean, you have to realize this, uh, ge you know, the uh, geometric progression that you have there of 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, and all of their descendants, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's uh, always possible that among all those people, you're going to run into somebody that seems to disappear off the map or off the off the record and uh, it's it's entirely possible that that uh, disappearing person was a criminal and so we're going to talk about how that all occurs and where we can go and what how we go about doing some research to find all that information out and the one problem you may have to do is to overcome a family tradition one way or the other in other words uh, hard feelings among the family members may have escalated to the point where they thought the guy was a criminal even though he wasn't and uh, the other side they may have been a criminal and been arrested and put to prison or executed or whatever else and the family uh, has refused to talk about it so it, it that person has been uh, essentially erased from the history of the family uh, so if, if depending on the uh, attitude of the family members towards it you may may say uh, you know, get to a certain uh, individual in your family line or as a relative and, and uh, be talking to your, your other relatives about that person and they say, well, we just don't talk about it. And so that's uh, the problem that you may have to overcome as uh, in getting into this subject altogether. But uh, what are the clues? What tells us that uh, an ancestor may have been uh, a criminal? Uh, first of all, a uh, sudden or unexplained disappearance from the records. Um, it's hard to tell at this point, looking at the records, the, the per if the person simply abandoned his family or his or her family or walked off into the wilderness and, and uh, disappeared and died, or um, 
any number of other things that could cause unexplained disappearances. But uh, putting the idea that this person was a criminal and arrest, arrested or incarcerated in this, into this uh, circumstance will give you at least one more place to start looking for information about this person who has mysteriously disappeared. Uh, a hush-hush family tradition, I already kind of alluded to that just a moment ago. Uh, basically, we don't talk about this person or this person is someone that we, we really can't, uh, uh, nobody says anything about. And that may be uh, an indication that e, A, either the person uh, did something that was uh, unforgiven by the family or could have, could have been something even to the nature of a criminal act. So this is another, another way of looking at, uh, at something that uh, is kind of a negative uh, evidence of what's happened to the individual. Um, good place to look, newspaper accounts. Uh, find out that your ancestor had some serious problems. Um, as a matter of fact, I can uh, relate to this directly. One of my ancestors um, had some trouble with the law. And uh, I was told repeatedly uh, growing up that, that this person had never been arrested and never been prosecuted. Uh, basically, this was for uh, polygamy back in the early in the uh, early 1900s, uh, after uh, the government was still arresting people and sending them off to jail and off to prison for for polygamy. And I uh, was told my my uh, ancestor never had a problem with it. And as a matter of fact, uh, how I discovered the fact that that was not the case was a newspaper account of him and many other prominent members of that particular community uh, pleading guilty to uh, federal charges in the federal courts uh, based on their polygamist association. So, um, you know, sometimes you, uh, you, you run across this even though the family tradition is being contradicted by the evidence. Um, obviously, if you find an actual record of an arrest or an incarceration, uh, if you find them on a list in prison someplace or whatever, uh, it's a pretty good clue that they were, uh, that there was some criminal activity involved of some, of some kind. So <clears throat> one of the things here is in order to understand the records and where to look for the records and what kinds of records may have been, been kept and where they may have been kept, all of that uh, is assisted measurably by having a little bit of knowledge of criminal law and procedure. Now, there's two parts of, uh, of law in, the, uh, in our country, in the United States, and generally around the world. You have uh, the law that's called substantive law, and that is the, the, that defines the actions of the citizens of that country between each other, between the government, between the entities in, the, uh, in that particular area. That substantive law, criminal law, is generally set forth in statutes. Now, one of the things about uh, the difference between a criminal law and a, and a civil law is uh, sometimes a little difficult to understand. On uh, There's two concepts here. When we talk about something being legal or illegal, um, Many people ask me all the time, for example, uh, is such and such illegal? Is it illegal for me to, and then they tell me something that they intend to do or have done, and, and uh, they want to know if they've got a problem. Well, illegal is, is defined by the criminal statutes of any part of the country in the United States. We have federal laws that define certain activities as illegal. We have state laws that define certain things as against the law or illegal. And we have other things that are um, in other levels, municipalities and counties and things like that, that, that are able to impose what are called criminal sanctions or uh, whatever. So what defines a criminal law? Basically, a criminal law is one that for which the violation of that particular law results in incarceration and being put in jail. If there is no possibility of being put in jail by violating that law, then 
it's probably not a criminal law. Now there's some sort of gray area crossover. Uh, so let me give you kind of an example. Uh, let's say for example, I uh, uh, buy a car and I fail to pay uh, the purchase price, uh, I can't make the payments, uh, and uh, so what happens? Well, that's a civil violation. I have a contract with the company that, that sold me the car or the finance company that paid for the, for the car to get to, to, for the purchase of the car. And my failure to make that payment is not a criminal act. It is basically a breach of contract act. And what's the recourse there? Well, they can't arrest you, they can't throw you in jail, but they could come and get the car. That's, they could repossess the car, come and get their property back from you. They could also sue you in a civil court and get a judgment against you for the remaining amount of money that was due after they sold the car. So that's the civil end of it. So how would that turn into a criminal act? Well, okay, so instead of buying the car, let's say I hotwired it and stole it. Okay, well, that does violate a criminal law. Uh, it actually, uh, you know, a whole set of laws uh, could be violated at that point. And uh, if, if they caught me for doing that, and put, they would have the right to charge me with a criminal act. And were I convicted on that act, it's very possible I'd end up spending some time in jail or prison or whatever, depending on the, on the circumstances, on the penalties or, or uh, things that could be imposed on the criminal person by virtue of, of uh, committing that particular crime. Now, so this is, this is sort of, the, it's kind of a hard concept, I think, for most people outside the legal community to, uh, to get that differentiation, but that's it's an important thing. Um, just because somebody says something is against the law, uh, then that doesn't mean that it's uh, a criminal act. Uh, it, it's only a criminal act if it could result in your arrest uh, trial for a criminal act and incarceration, or in some cases, probation or fines or all of the other things that we've evolved in our community to as a response to, to criminal activity. And the one important factor about this is that the plaintiff in these actions, I mean, it's the person bringing the lawsuit, the, the entity bringing the lawsuit, is always the state or other governmental agency. It has to be a government entity to bring a criminal law. So most criminal cases that you'll see will be, say something like the state versus Doe, John Doe, and that would be the uh, dead giveaway that this was uh, possibly a criminal action. Now, the states can bring civil actions. They could sue you for, for destroying government property, which may be a criminal, have a criminal aspect, but that may also be a civil, uh, have civil re repercussions. So you would have to pay for the cost of the damage that you uh, caused to the government. Um, if you breached a contract with the government, they're not going to throw you in jail. They're going to sue you under the under the contract law and uh, to get the, your, the damages that the government may have, su have suffered as a result of your breach of contract. And for example, you agreed to build a road for the government and, and you just abandoned the project. They, they very may, may well um, sue you civilly. Um, but whenever you're involved with the government, you have to be really careful because uh, even though you think it may be just a civil violation, there may also be some criminal ap ap uh, implications. It, this happens all the time. In fact, if you read the newspapers, um, I don't know if that's something I encourage people to do, but anyway, if you do read the newspapers, then what you're going to find is uh, certain government officials who have done things that are wrong and the question is what they're going to do with them. Are they going to pr prosecute them as criminals? Are they going to just kick them out of office? Are they going to what they're going to do? Okay, so you, when you start thinking of in kind of broad terms, then you can see how it's very, very possible that some, somebody in your family did something that may have been uh, violated some kind of law that was uh, defined as a criminal law and ended up paying a criminal penalty, which may, may have included being put in jail. Um, 
and uh, and that's probably one of the easiest ways to tell the difference. Now, understanding a criminal law case, how this how the law proceeds, um, this, is, this is something I used to say quite frequently uh, as I had, to, and perhaps it helps to mention as it was introduced that I did practice law, a trial law for 39 years, and for a few of those years I I was uh, involved in the criminal justice system representing uh, clients who were appointed by the court. In other words, I was a court-appointed attorney for uh, criminals. And uh, so it was kind of an interesting time. Uh, it lasted only a couple of years, uh, three or four years, and then I kind of refused to take any more criminal cases because it was a little bit... Uh, it was pr it was actually the real basic reason for it is it wasn't very profitable. It was... Uh, it, you can, a lot of a lot of better ways to spend your time to make some money to survive than trying to be a criminal defense attorney, especially being paid by the government. Uh, back then, back then, even even when we were when it was uh, many many years ago, this is looking like you know 45 year, 40 years ago or more, they were still only paying like 11 bucks an hour, which was even enough to cover our overhead in the, in the law office. So it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't profitable to do, but it was uh, when I was a young attorney and needing work. It was one way to get a little bit of money to come in. Okay, well, let's talk about a criminal law case. Um, a criminal law cases uh, are different than civil cases. A civil case has been brought by anybody, anybody who has what's called standing. That means has the uh, ability to bring a lawsuit in any particular court. Um, and that's part of becoming a lawyer is understanding what that term means and what it, what all the implications are of, of who can bring a case and who can't bring a case. Okay, so now a, mo a moment ago I spoke about what we call substantive criminal law. The substantive criminal law is uh, says that uh, stealing a certain amount of money or uh, or doing a certain act. Uh, is a violation of the criminal law, and then an, a penalty is imposed by the law. Uh, in other words, the penalty may be incarceration, it may be a fine, it may be both, it may be other things that are required by the law, and uh, that is the substantive criminal law. The rest of everything else is called procedure, and that's criminal procedure, and that, that's all written down in books that are uh, called uh, procedural books uh, and uh, published uh, by every single jurisdiction. If you want to, you can look it up online and see what the criminal procedure is for your, your uh, state or your jurisdiction, your county or your state, um, but, uh, or any place else you might be living in the world. Uh, you can always find out uh, ultimately what the criminal law is. But the procedural part of it means what do you do with the person after they're arrested? Okay, now let me give you an example of, of, of the, uh, kind of the beginning uh, threshold. First of all, you have uh, people who are involved in the criminal justice system. You have, a, you have the people who enforce the law, and they can be police or sheriffs or marshals or uh, agents or any kind of person who has been, uh, who has been a, a officially recognized by a governmental agency as an enforcement person, a constable. Uh, there's all sorts of different levels of, of enforcers in the, in, here in the United States. And I'm going to speak primarily of U.S. law, uh, but it does apply generally in the same concepts apply uh, around the world in, in almost every country of the world. So what happens is those people have certain duties and limitations. Uh, in the United States, for example, everyone who's ever watched a TV show uh, a detective TV show, um, um, anything from CSI to NCIS to uh, even going back into, into ancient uh, television history, Perry Mason. Uh, we know that there was uh, there are a policeman out there, and the policemen are the people who are charged with enforcing the laws. Well, what does a policeman do? Well, a policeman, when they see something that happens or they're referred to something or they find someone who's been uh, who has been uh, uh, alleged to be a criminal or is is in the suspicion is that this person is a criminal, then they do what they do, and that is they arrest people. Now, an arrest 
does not mean that a criminal act has been committed by this person. Arrest is simply, the term arrest means detain. So whenever you are detained, no matter how slight the detainment, it's technically an arrest. So if, the, if a policeman, if you're speeding down the road and a policeman comes up behind you in a patrol car with his lights flashing and pulls you over to the side of the road, under the criminal law, that is technically an arrest. Now, motor vehicle laws kind of live in their own world. Uh, there are criminal aspects to motor, motor vehicle laws, but they're not, a, not everything's a criminal act. So, you know, if you're speeding, it depends on whether the law has defined what you're doing in your, as you're speeding as being a, uh, uh, as criminal. Uh, that example is, in, is easy to, to explain. If you're speeding down the road and you uh, and you exceeded the speed limit and the police officer pulls you over and gives you a ticket, that's not a criminal citation. It's a, it's a motor vehicle citation. But if they, if you're speeding down the road and they stop you and you turn out to be drunk over the legal limit or you're possessing some illegal substance in your car that's discovered in the course of the of the uh, of the stop by the by the police then you've moved from a sort of quasi regulatory uh, issue into a criminal issue rather rather quickly you've stepped across the line so that's that's the the difference now the initial part of a criminal uh, activity is the investigation and all of this um, and as i mentioned this in the conju in conjunction with the idea of doing genealogical research about a person in your ancestry or someone you're interested in doing investigation about is that um, every one of these steps in the criminal law case generate records and potential records that could be used to find and identify this person and as we go through as I go through the presentation here I'm going to give you a concrete example of, of these records uh, that, that I've found about an individual in a specific case who happened to be sort of a rebel relation. He, he married one of my relatives. So we now know that about him. Okay, first of all comes the investigation. Uh, if you've watched a whole lot of TV, uh, you know, crime and uh, detective series, you're pretty much up to speed with the idea of investigation. I used to tell my clients when they would come in, I would say, forget you everything you've ever seen on TV. You, this isn't going to work like TV. It's going to be a lot of diff lot different than TV. Let me tell you what the difference is. The word com can be summarized in one word, boring. There is nothing entertaining about the normal court proceedings that anybody would want to do or watch. Very, very seldom does anything go on in court that, that's beyond just routine type stuff that's just really not exciting to watch. Okay, but now we're going to investigate. So there's records of the investigation. There's a police file. Uh, if you're used to watching one of these criminal investigation shows, you know the guy always walks in, the, the detective always walks in and plops the record down on the table. You know, he's always got this, this uh, record that he's plopping down on the table. And that record is, uh, is what they've investigated. That's the evidence that they've created against this person. Assuming that there is an investigation that precedes the arrest, instead of there being an arrest and an investigation that follows the arrest, uh, which they can do, uh, the arrest then happens. The arrest is in the United States, in this terminology, at this point in a legal in a criminal proceedings, is a formal a moment in time. And in the United States, you can always tell when a person is formally arrested, and in many other places of the world that have adopted the same kind of standard is that they read you what are called your Miranda rights. And now they don't have to do that quite so much as they used to. But um, it is and has been for many, many years in the United States. Now, whether or not they gave the person the Miranda rights has to do with evidence and the presentation of the case in court. And it doesn't have anything much to do with um, finding that person in a, in a genealogical sense. But here we go. So now, once the person is arrested, and uh, in this case, we're going to assume the person was put in jail of some kind, detained uh, in, uh, in, a, in a, some kind of facility. And uh, 
in the United States, the next step in the in the criminal proceeding is that the person has a certain time period from the, the moment they are arrested to have what's called an initial appearance in court. And the whole idea there is they have to go before a judge. And by the way, the judges will, are, who work in this area uh, work like way into the night, and early in the morning, and uh, sometimes all night long in a big, huge city. Because as people are brought in, there's a time, there's a, a time limit that's set. And so that person has to be uh, arraigned, which is the term and make its initial appearance which uh, at, before a judge. And the judge then reviews the case and sets bail, if any, lets the person go, releases them on what's called on their own recognizance or whatever. Now, by that time, there are always, there's already a substantial amount of records that have been created about this procedure. And uh, those records are going to be preserved uh, basically for a, a very, very, very long time by the courts. And what we're talking about here is having to do the research into court records. So uh, in any given area, if the person, if you're wanting to find out if a person had ever been arrested, is, uh, is you're going to need to uh, discover where uh, the court records have been kept, uh, where they have been transferred to, where they might be made available, and uh, then uh, have the, uh, you have to take the initiative to go find those court records and, um, and have them uh, and search through them by whatever means. They could be on paper sitting in a courthouse, in a basement, in an attic, or they could be in a, in a storage facility. They could be online. They could be all digitized. They could be a microfilm. There could be all sorts of ways that those records could have been produced. Now, the person is, if they're in jail or if they're out on uh, on their own recognizance or they've set bail, they've paid the money they need to to get out of jail, then uh, they go through what are called pretrial procedures. In the United States, a person is entitled to have an attorney appointed for them if they cannot afford one. Um, the court usually makes this determination and um, if the person pleads that they don't have any money, now what happens, let's say the person is really a criminal and they lie and say, well, no, I don't have any money. Well, the, the problem is going to happen with that guy is they're going to end up with a brand new attorney out of law school, court appointed attorney type guy, or somebody who can't, uh, as I discovered after a couple of years being in the criminal law, that, that really has to, has been taking these cases because they're, they need the, the extra cash. And so it's not really like they're really going to get a, you know, they're going to, maybe they'll get the best attorney that ever happened in the history of the world. And on the other hand, they may not. And so uh, if someone has the means to retire attorney, they probably will because they want to get, um, be a little bit more sure that they're going to get uh, good, good representation. Uh, but on the other hand, I want to say one thing that the, that the, the professional defense attorneys, the people who have made the, uh, their career out of being defense attorneys, uh, are some of the most uh, capable people in the legal community. So uh, the fact that you have, were assigned uh, a, an attorney who was, uh, uh, who may have been uh, on the court, what's called the court panel, does not mean that the person is either inexperienced or new, but it's kind of like taking a chance. And that's sometimes the, the kind of the motivation in getting people to pay for an attorney. Now, all of that creates records. And we have pretrial procedures. That's where uh, the, the defense attorney and the prosecuting attorney get together and uh, decide uh, and exchange information, get ready to go to court, uh, get ready for a trial, uh, decide, the prosecutor decides whether they want to proceed with the case. Um, uh, there's a, a couple of different ways that, the, that these cases are, are um, instigated. One is you can uh, start a, tr a trial by uh, having the, an arrest and then the uh, next level up uh, a legal official, the county attorney or the state attorney or the federal attorney uh, decides whether or not to prosecute the case after the person's been arrested, if there's enough evidence, if there's not enough evidence or whatever. And uh, once that decision is made, you proceed on what's called an information, which is uh, a way of determining 
the word information in that category is an actually a, a technical term of meaning the the there has been a, it's a document that's prepared that says yeah we're going to go ahead and and uh, and prosecute this person on the other hand in certain types of very very complex and or really uh, high high level high uh, visibility type legal cases <clears throat> they may take it <clears throat> the the evidence before what's called a grand jury, uh, and, the, and these people are called together to determine whether or not there is a, uh, a case that could be carried forward into court. Okay, so you've got a lot of different kinds of procedures out there. Now, eventually, you get into a trial. Now, here's what's going to happen. The reason I mentioned newspapers originally is that <clears throat> the newspapers are going to have a record of an arrest um, if. Uh, there's one thing that they re they are absolutely good about reporting is when someone's arrested, and uh, if you uh, if you are on the news even now when we have online news and uh, you're still going to get uh, a pretty much a, a detail of of any kind of visible kind of, of arrest, and especially if there's a, a major crime associated with it, but. In, uh, in in reality, people who are arrested for uh, things like being drunk on the street or uh, shoplifting something out of a store, uh, unless you live in a small community, it's unlikely that the newspapers are going to pick that kind of stuff up. But by the time you get to a trial, it's possible, very possible, that um, you'll be able to do it. Now, what happens sometimes here is that in the United States, because of basically, uh, quite bluntly, an overload of criminal cases. Uh, we have evolved a system of kind of shunting people out of the trial system by letting them plead guilty and negotiating what's called a plea and uh, with a plea agreement. And that's, that's usually, and, and today's real at reality of today's world is that happens like uh, 75, 80% of the time, maybe even 90% of the time. Uh, the person who's uh, accused really doesn't have any defense. Uh, he, you know, they they're walked out of the store with the, the object. They were on video, and the and the and the security stopped them. Uh, I mean, are you going to claim you, you know, didn't have it or whatever? Anyway, um, there's usually no defense, and so it doesn't go to trial. So very few cases, by the way, go to trial uh, in any part of the law. Um, it was almost unusual if the case went to trial, but uh, in my in my particular uh, legal practice over the years, um, we had so many cases. Uh, sometimes my uh, the number of cases that I had was well above a hundred or more, uh, into the 150, close to 200 active cases at a time, and it was just inevitable that some of those cases were going to go to trial. So criminal cases were, none, were not the exception, and, and uh, I did sit through a, a very large number of criminal, of criminal trials over the years, the few years that I was doing um, criminal work. Now, after the trial, the person is either released because they're found not guilty or they're sentenced and uh, found guilty and then sentenced to the, of the criminal thing. Every one of these steps, and reiterate this, create a big pile of records, uh, depending on the court and depending on the severity of the crime of the criminal act, uh, it could be very simple paperwork, nothing more than a citation and a, a court appearance and a fine. On the other hand, it could uh, the trial proceedings could last for weeks or months or even into uh, even more than a year. And uh, some of the real high visibility cases, the the amount of information and records in those cases is phenomenally large. Now, the interesting thing is, you don't ever know if your ancestors got involved in this stuff until you start looking at it, and you may find a, a huge criminal trial that was uh, that uh, even the fact that your ancestor was accused and stood trial and was not convicted and was set free. And that may be the reason he's your ancestor or she's your ancestor, because they got out of jail. 
But on the other hand, uh, you may find out that one of your ancestors, uh, like I have on, uh, on occasion, uh, ended up in, uh, in, a, in a federal prison somewhere. So uh, that's not impossible. Okay, then uh, you get into the incarceration, and you may actually find the fact that your ancestor was a criminal because you discover that they were in jail. Then you're going to have to, then, then obviously, if you have any interest in doing genealogical research at all, you're going to have to figure out what he did. You want to know what happened. How did this guy say? Now, I use the term he here, and I, and I don't want to be discriminatory at all. Women do get arrested, but on the, in, in our historic and going back historically in the United States, women have a far lower rate of, of arrest and incar incarceration than men do. So uh, your chances of finding your, of your ancestor being a woman and being incarcerated are probably not as large as, the, as they are if they're male. Okay, so what do we look for? What are we going to look for when we're out there looking for the criminal? We're going to look for documents that were created in the, in the course of the investigation and the prosecution of this criminal act. The first one is called depositions, and this is testimony taken. Uh, affidavits is another way of, of uh, putting this kind of testimony in. This is testimony that's taken to discover what happened. Uh, you could also call this a witness interview. Um, they're formally done and recorded, and uh, that is uh, that's part of the records that are that are and may be available for uh, for giving you a lot more information about your ancestor. Uh, indictments out there, those are the record, records of the grand jury, and those records are, are preserved and available in many courts. And so you could get through and, and read what, the, uh, what evidence was presented in the, in the course of, of the grand jury proceedings, and then uh, read about what the decision of the grand jury was when they decided to proceed with the prosecution of the case. The whole thing is called a case file, and so case files are, are really contain all this information uh, that's preserved by the courts. Now, how much of this that's done by the law enforcement agencies is preserved? Um, that's a little more problematic. Uh, getting into the police files uh, may or may not have been preserved. Uh, many times, however, uh, the testimony of the police officer is preserved in the case file, so the police officer... Um, who gives, is usually one of the witnesses uh, in the case because uh, the arresting officer usually has to come and testify about how the person was arrested, where they were found, what they were doing, and, and what the circumstances were when they were arrested. So this is uh, this is another part of the record that you'll find in case files in, in Facebook. Okay, so now let's go some, through some examples here of the documents that are involved. Uh, this is a newspaper article that was uh, that was found. I found, and uh, basically, this newspaper article tar talks about uh, Edward Rodwell, who was 21, and John Bly. And Red Edward Rodwell is the one who married my re relative, and uh, so he was the the criminal. And this is the arresting. Here it is. They were uh, arrested and charged with burglary of the house of Thomas Allen of Shudham on the 15th of May of 1837. And they stole, this is a list of the items that they stole, razors and a microscope. This is probably very, probably the most interesting part of this whole proceeding is why these people, I, I'm sure they thought it was worth something, they could sell it. There's probably no other reason that they did that. They were found in the house of Rodwell. So Rodwell, they went, got a, uh, a, uh, they got us a uh, charge from the judge to go out and uh, get uh, and get the uh, get go into the person's house. They, back in 1837, by the way, they didn't really need to do all that stuff. There weren't those limitations on the police. If they thought it was there, they'd go search it. Uh, there was not all the proceedings we have presently in the United States about. Uh, having to go get uh, a, a subpoena or any other kind of document to go uh, to get into the property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that's kind of been built up over the years, all of those restrictions that you see on TV. But 
right now, uh, back then, if they got the guy, they probably hauled him home and went and searched his house and found the goods and took all that down to the court and got him arrested and put in jail right on the spot. And their footprints were found in the newly mowed lawn. So they got, uh, they had a problem. Okay, so next thing that happened is we have a, another document. This all happened in England, by the way, so this was not the United States. Was the UK prison hulk registers and letter books, 1802 to 1849. And, the, and this is where Edward Rodwell is, uh, appears. And this is uh, where he's being held in the jail. Uh, he's... Uh, this is it's not clear from this whether he's pre-sentence or post-sentence but it's this is another record that we that i found in this case of the actual record of him being in jail and it lists all the things that he did like breaking and house breaking and and the burglary and all of the other things they could charge him with in england okay so uh, there's the actual entry for edward rodwell 21 house breaking now the next document that we came that I came across was the New South Wales Australia convict record of 1810 to 1891. Okay, so what so what happened to uh, Mr. Edward Rodwell when he got arrested in England? Well, in that time period between 1810 and 1891, uh, England had a, a, a pretty common uh, solution to the overcrowding in their prisons. They would uh, uh, for almost any crime, it didn't matter the severity, uh, there's often a, a kind of a, a, a feeling here that you're kind of, that people were arrested for inconsequential crimes. There's this, you know, the common viewpoint here is that they were arrested for stealing a loaf of bread. Well, yeah, they were arrested for stealing a loaf of bread. And they were convicted and sent to prison for stealing a loaf of bread. But they were also convicted and sent to prison for housebreaking, for rape, for murder, for everything else that was going on there. And they did pack those people off and ship them off, all, all of them off to Australia. So the guys who ended up in Australia were really a bunch of criminals. There was not a question of these people were all being uh, imposed upon by the British justice system. Uh, they were really, in most cases, almost every case, they were... Uh, in some, in a lot of cases, hardened criminals who had had uh, records of many, many offenses. But in this case, of course, uh, here's Rodwell. He's 21, uh, and he's uh, he gets uh, arrested for housebreaking. What we don't have in the story is how much, how many other criminal acts he'd committed bef that he wasn't caught for. He just happened to get caught for this one, and. Um, Actually, how we found Edward Rodwell was not going to the British records and finding out that he was sent to Australia. It was starting out with the Australian records, finding out that he was a criminal, and then going to look for the British records of how he got to Australia and what he did before he got there. So uh, it, this is kind of a backwards uh, look at it because I'm coming at it from the standpoint of chronologically through the the criminal action, and yet the, the research started at the end product when he was already convicted and in Australia. Okay, so they would do what was called transportation or transporting of criminals, and they would put them on a ship and ship them to Australia and to the United States, and I mean, not to, to America, before the United States, obviously. But after 1800, that was uh, the United States, so they stopped shipping their criminals to, the, to America. Um, by the way, estimates are that uh, there was a very, a very significant percentage of the early colonists in America who were not here because they were trying to come to, uh, uh, they weren't the poor masses, hut and huddled masses yearning to be free. They were criminals that were shipped across the country and dumped into America by the British um, in their system of transportation. So uh, it's interesting that you might get back into the same kind of situation as you do research back into your uh, New England or, or Eastern uh, seaboard ancestors, if you have any. So here's another document. This is the New South Wales, Australia, Jail Description and Entrance Books, 1818 to 1930. And once again, this is they, uh, in this case, they got to New South Wales and uh, this Rodman got to New South Wales and Australia and was thrown in jail in Australia. Okay, so he, 
he didn't just get a free ticket once he got to Australia, he was actually in jail. And here's another one, the New South Wales Convent Indents. Okay, so here's uh, another record that was kept of the convicts. Now, this would mean that he was out of jail, probably, and still registered as a convict. Now, what happened with Edward Rodwell is uh, another one here is another convent, uh, convict ed indent record, later one for the same person. So here we have kind of a step-by-step -step documentation of what happened to this guy, uh, tracing him from England to uh, Australia. And now we have the convict pardons and tickets of leave. Now here's what happened. He married my ancestor, um, ancestors. Uh, no, she is my ancestor. He, she married my ancestor, direct ancestor. And uh, then um, in under the law that existed in, in uh, Australia and England at the time, uh, the part the uh, convict was then pardoned. They all pardoned them all when they got married. This was kind of an incentive to get married. So he married he married my ancestor, and then shortly thereafter, he ran away, abandoned her there in Australia, and ran away with her sister. And they went back to England. Now, it was illegal for him to go back to England, and there's some more records that show how he illegally got into England. And then, uh, based on his pardon, he really didn't have anything to fear, so he... Uh, he, they, they were married in England and uh, uh, lived there and had a whole bunch of family and they have their own descendants. So if you were uh, a descendant of this Rodwell character, then you'd find out that your great, great, great grandfather or whatever was uh, the criminal and was transported to Australia. So here's the, uh, here's another record. This was, uh, uh, this is just a record to show uh, the kinds of things that you would uh, you you might find in a record uh, in the United States, and that is uh, that uh, this is U.S. Census record, and the census took all the records of everybody that was in the jails and prisons, as well as the people who had houses and were walking around free. So you find a long list of people in the name of your ancestor in this long list and it says that this is a prison record, then you uh, you found your ancestor in the, in the prison. And so this one, for instance, is the Merced City uh, County Jail and uh, in Merced, California, and it's listing all of the inmates at the time that the census was taken. Now, if you need to go out and find the court records, we have a, a, a very interesting a new kind of not new in the sense of really new, but uh, a development from uh, Google over the past couple of years, and that is that they have a program out there called Google Scholar. And uh, you may not be familiar with this, but it's a marvelous record for doing, uh, marvelous resource for doing uh, finding records, especially court records. Now these, uh, fortunately, these are uh, this is a huge mass of records. But unfortunately, these are courts of record, meaning it only their ancestor would only show up in these records if they appealed their conviction uh, in a low cor lower court and then moved up to a court of appeals and ultimately to a Supreme Court. Uh, the, the court of appeals and Supreme Court records are the only ones that are called courts of record that write um, opinions. Now here, for example, is a an opinion of the United States versus Morgan and the Supreme Court of the United States. It was argued back in 1953 and 1954. So if you have a, a question, here's just another place. You do a name search for your ancestor in, Gil, in Google Scholar in the court cases in any, all across the whole United States at all the levels of appellate courts up to and including the state of Supreme Courts and the US Supreme Court to see if your ancestor was ever in court. Now, I like to search here because I can, they also uh, are, every word is searchable. And so uh, I'm listed as attorney of record on many of these cases in there. And so I can just go in there and search for myself and find all sorts of records. Okay, so now we're kind of back to the newspapers. And, and here's an example of, a, of an article in the newspaper about a, a prominent criminal action that was being conducted against an individual in the Washington Times. 
And uh, there's uh, the place where you might want to start with the newspaper search. There are lots of big newspaper uh, databases out there online that you can search. But uh, one large free one is the Library of Congress. That's loc.gov. And uh, that will give you a, uh, a huge number of, uh, of over 12 million, presently over 12 million pages of newspapers in the United States. And that's where I found uh, my ancestor, who was uh, traditionally, uh, was I was told that he'd never been prosecuted and ended up that not only was he prosecuted, he pled guilty and was, uh, actually they didn't impose any penalty against him. That He was far enough along in that time period that they were convicting him, but they weren't doing anything with the polygamy people. So now we've got uh, online searches at the government. This is on uh, Ancestry. They have court, governmental, and criminal records right there. There's a, a huge database on Ancestry of, of criminal records that you can search. And now in just an online search for the individual may turn up a database of, uh, of criminal actions. This one was the US Album of Criminals, 1906. Uh, it was a book that just happens to highlight all these criminals that uh, were arrested in 1906. You'd never know what you're going to find when you get online and start searching around for the information. And then you can find here uh, another ancestry file, which is the U.S. Circuit Court criminal case files from 1790 to 1871. So we have almost 100 years of, of criminal uh, court records on, uh, on ancestry. So, for instance, here um, on uh, Find My Past, which is the um, uh, findmypast.com, which is the uh, uh, UK, uh, big UK uh, website, and is also acquiring a lot of US records now, uh, they have uh, an article, a search guide for finding your criminal ancestors. And uh, one of the records there on Find My Past was Chicago, Illinois Police Department Homicide Record Index. So here's an index to police records in, uh, in Chicago between 1870 and 1930, which is a pretty interesting time. It's too bad they didn't go another 10 years with these records because that was prohibition and that was the time when the really we were really having an interesting time in Chicago. So... There's lots of interesting records here. Uh, National Archives has a, a how to look for criminals and convicts. Um, you can get, this is actually not our National Archives. This is the UK National Archives. Uh, so this is uh, the, over there in England, the National Archives of England. And they have a, 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 an instructional part that tells you how to uh, look for criminals. So there's, it's, it's basically a situation where we go out and we look and look, uh, search for the types of records. And as I mentioned, uh, understanding the, the criminal procedure, uh, get, becoming familiar with the terminology and some of the laws that were available, uh, the criminal laws over the years, will assist you measurably in uh, finding the records that you need to determine what happened to these elusive ancestors that may have ended up being in the criminal court system. So thanks for watching and uh, remind you that these uh, webinars are all recorded and uploaded to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel and we thank you for coming and listening and we uh, and urge you if you could to uh, subscribe so we can uh, get a little bit of visibility out there. Thank All right. Thank you very much, James, for the wonderful webinar. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, as we said at the beginning, our next webinar will be tomorrow at 4.30 p.m., and we hope to see you back then. In the meantime, hope you have a great evening and um, have a great holiday season.